thanks for inviting me to give a, a talk at your, at your seminar. So I would like to present uh, our uh, results uh, with the standard scopy on a quantum walk state transfer on a, on a hypercube graph. So here's just a brief outline. I will, I will make a very brief introduction of, of, the, of the idea behind this uh, uh, approach to state transfer. And then we first have a look at the quantum walk search on a hypercube because uh, the, the, this is approach is essentially utilizes quantum walk uh, search algorithm. And then we, then we look uh, uh, at the state transfer between the antipodal vertices. So that can be analyzed in, uh, along the same lines as we uh, show for the quantum walk search. And then we look at also at the state transfer between uh, vertices of arbitrary distance. There we have some analytical results, but it's, uh, it's mo it more relies on, on numerical investigation because the, the, the problem cannot be simplified as much as for the search or for the state transfer between the antipodes. Um, so uh, the the problem that we are looking for or we are aiming at is the is we have a, a graph and we want to transfer a quantum particle from one vertex to another uh, by means of the discrete time quantum walk. Uh, so the evolution of this uh, dynamical system will be given by uh, a unitary operator that makes a single step of, of the evolution. And the, uh, the evolution operator uh, consists actually of two unitaries. One is usually called a quantum coin. And this, this coin acts locally on individual vertices of the graph. And then uh, another uh, operator is applied, which is the, the shift operator or conditional shift operator. And this uh, propagates the, the quantum walker along the arcs of the, of the graph. So we, like we consider a graph that uh, we have uh, edges oriented, like we have the arcs uh, uh, oriented in both, both directions. And uh, there are different approaches to, to this problem. Uh, I think uh, what uh, say Ada, Chen and other people also uh, from the seminar are doing say that you can, you can design the, uh, the coins or in the continuous time quantum walk case, you can design the, the couplings and so on uh, in a way that you perform this state transfer from one vertex to another. Um, we follow a, a slightly uh, different approach that, that is based on the, on the quantum walk search. So in the, in the, in the, in the search uh, algorithm, uh, you are looking for a marked vertex and marked vertex means that on that vertex, you have a different coin operator than, than on the others. And uh, so, so for the state transfer, we will have these uh, two marked vertices uh, and you only modify the dynamics, this, this local coin on these two vertices on the, on the sender and the receiver. And the rest of the graph is like passive. You don't, you don't change that uh, dynamics there. Um, and uh, we, initialize the, the walk on one of the marked vertex on the sender. And our aim is to evolve this quant discrete time quantum walk to reach the, the second vertex with high probability after certain number of steps. And this, this number of steps is uh, usually is proportional to, or it's of the order of the square root of, of total number of vertices. Uh, this comes from the quantum walk search, which, which uh, uh, most, on most of the graphs gives you a quadratic speed up over the classical search. So, so you can find the marked item 
in an order of square root of n uh, iterations. And the same applies here for the, for the state transfer. Uh, so the, uh, in this approach, the, the sender and the receiver, they don't have to know each other position. Like you don't design the, the dynamics on the graph to, to reach from one particular vertex to another. Uh, they only have to adjust the, the dynamics locally on their vertices for which they have to know, say, the size of the graph to, to set the uh, local dynamics properly. And also they, they have to, like the, 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 the guy at the receiver vertex has to make a measurement on, uh, on an, uh, after an appropriate number of steps. And this also depends on the size of the, of the graph. And the uh, approach we, we used to um, investigate this problem is based on the dimensional reduction that you utilize the, the symmetries of the graph. In this case, it will be the hypercube uh, so that you reduce the problem to, uh, by, by finding either exact invariant subspace or in the case of the hypercube, it will be only an approximate invariant subspace. But essentially, you, you uh, reduce the problem to finding um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a, of a uh, unitary matrix with a, a fixed uh, dimension. That will be, a, say, three by three matrix or a five by five matrix in our case, where the size of the graph um, enters, uh, it affects the, the, the matrix coefficients, but the, the size of the matrix is fixed. Okay, so let's start with the quantum walk search. Um, and just to fix the notation first. Uh, so for the hypercube, we will use the, the usual notation that the vertices are, are um, labeled by n-bit strings. So this vector x is a, is a n uh, binary numbers, x1 to xn, and to Every uh, of uh, every vertex or every uh, such a vector x, we uh, assign a basis state of the of the Hilbert space of the positions. Uh, so the sket x will be the orthonormal basis of the of the possible positions of the quantum walker. Uh, but this is not enough to define a unitary discrete time evolution. We also have to have the, the quantum coin that uh, mixes the uh, uh, directions on uh, every vertex. So on, uh, on the hypercube, if we have an n-dimensional hypercube, each vertex has uh, n uh, neighbors. Uh, so uh, to every direction d from uh, one to n, uh, we have the unit vector in, in this direction, which is just that there's a one in on the uh, d position and all the other elements are zero. And to every such direction, we assign a basis state of the, of the coin space. And for the marking, we will actually uh, attach a loop to the marked vertex. So uh, will not be just the hypercube, but the hypercube cube with a loop on the, on the marked vertex. So there we have one more uh, basis state, which we denote as, as get zero. And uh, then the, the whole Hilbert space of the quantum walk for such a uh, graph, so hypercube with a loop on the marked vertex, we can write it this way, that it's a direct sum of local Hilbert spaces on every vertex. Uh, so for uh, non-marked vertices, we have just the linear span of the sket xd, where d goes from 1 to n. And for the marked vertex, without loss of generality, we can say that it's uh, the uh, vertex, uh, well, we have all zeros. Uh, we have the additional uh, coin state corresponding to the loop. So there D goes from zero to N. 
So this is the uh, Hilbert space and the basis vectors. Now, how does the evolution uh, operator look like? So for the discrete time quantum walk, we iterate this uh, unitary operator. I, I kept the notation from the paper where we like first uh, introduced the evolution operator for the uh, the walk on the hypercube without the marked vertex. So that's why that that we call U, and this is called an U prime. So that's why we start with U prime already. Uh, so it's a product of the coin and the shift. Uh, this conditional shift operator, it moves the, the particle, the walker from the vertex according to the direction of the coin. So if I'm at the vertex X and I have the direction D, I, I move from uh, X to X uh, plus this unit vector ED modulo two. And we have also the loop at the marked vertex. So if I'm uh, in the loop, I'll stay in the loop. So this is the shift operator and the, the coin, uh, which uh, acts on the individual vertices locally. It mixes somehow the, the directions or the states of the directions. So we use, uh, what is the typical choice for the quantum walk search algorithms, so-called Grover coin operator on the non-marked vertices, and then something which I denote as minus G prime on the marked vertex. I will show that on the next slide. So the coin operator looks like this. I have the everywhere the Grover coin except at the marked vertex, and at the marked vertex I have the minus G prime. And this Grover uh, diffusion operator, it comes from the original Grover abstract Grover search algorithm. And it can be defined for an arbitrary uh, finite dimensional uh, vector space. You can define this, this unitary operator. It's a twice the projection of the symmetric superposition of all basis states with equal weights minus the identity. Uh, so this, uh, uh, Grover operator has some nice properties like that it's invariant under all permutations. So it doesn't really matter how you label or order your directions, it, it treats them all equally. And the, the marking is done by this operator G prime or minus G prime, which is a, a modified Grover coin by having this weighted loop. This was introduced in a, in a series of, and then investigated in a series of papers by, by Thomas Wong. Uh, so it has a similar shape. We have twice the projector on some state minus identity. So this is again a unitary operator. And this, uh, this SL state is that we have the superposition of all basis states plus of all the directions plus the loop, uh, which has some weight L. And we have, of course, it has to be then also in the normalization of the vector to have the unit norm. So this is the uh, coin operator on the marked vertex. Now in the, in the quantum walk search, the initial state of the search algorithm, we, we choose it always in a way that it's like, it shows our, uh, lack of knowledge of uh, of the uh, of the solution. So, like we we choose the state that is an equal weight superposition of all basis states, except for the loop, because that that's added on the marked vertex. So we start in such a superposition of all all the arcs, so to say, with equal weights. Now the the target state of the of the search, like what we will show in a few minutes that the over the time the the wave function of the probability amplitude will build up on the loop on the on the marked vertex so this is uh, another vertex uh, another state that we will use in this approximate invariant subspace uh, but uh, uh, before we get to that we do this uh, dimensional reduction of the of the problem and um, it, it follows the, 
the same idea that was actually done, I'm afraid, almost 20 years ago by, by Shenvey, Kempe and Weili, who first investigated the quantum bulk search on the, on the hypercube in the discrete time setting. They just haven't considered the loop on the, on the marked vertex. Uh, and the loop somehow makes it, as, as Thomas Wong showed, the loop makes it somehow simpler or the, the um, evolution of the success probability is, is smoother, nicer than without the loop. So what you do uh, is quite straightforward that you can group the, the vertices according to the distance from the marked vertex and you group them together and you reduce the problem for, uh, from the hypercube to a walk on a finite line, uh, just the, the position on the line is given by the distance of the vertices from the uh, marked vertex. And so we will have for an n-dimensional hypercube, we reduce it to a walk on a, a line of n plus one, uh, n plus one uh, vertices where we have the loop at the, at the marked vertex. Uh, but the, the coin operators will now on this line, they will be dependent on the position. So how this uh, is done actually is that you, you can define these two plus one orthonormal uh, vectors. So X is, uh, will be, this X will be then the position on the, on the line but it's uh, on the hypercube is the, is the distance from the marked vertex. So it's the, because the marked vertex is all zero string. So it's the Hamming weight of the, of the uh, vector X. So you put together all vertices with this uh, Hamming, uh, uh, this, cat, uh, this axis which have Hamming weight X and you take that the direction that on this XD you have zero or on XD you have one. So this defines then on the line a state where we, I have the particle on vertex X and it will move to the right. So to X plus one. And these vectors then define uh, on the line in the reduction, uh, a particle on vertex X and in the, in the uh, state uh, going left. So it, after I apply the shift operator, it would move to X minus one. So the shift operator, if you, if you write it down, how it acts on these uh, basis states, that's just what I said. So if I'm at X in the state, in this state XR, I move to the X plus one and with the state L and uh, the other way around. But we also have the loop at the marked vertex. And I mean, the shift operator does not change this state. So it, it just stays the same. So this is how the shift then acts on these vectors, how it, how it works on the line. The coin uh, uh, on, the, on the line, it will be dependent on the position. So now these, these coin operators, these Cs, Cx, are two by two matrices, except for uh, the last one, because uh, if you look at the line here uh, at the, uh, antipod vertex to the marked one, the line ends. So here I have just the one, uh, one basis state. This, I, I don't have uh, cat N, R, because I cannot move further to the right. So there the, this coin is, is just a one, one by one matrix uh, number equal to one. But on, on non-zero positions, so for X, uh, if it's not the marked vertex, I have uh, these uh, two by two matrices, but this uh, angle given by this angle theta X, which depends on the uh, position X, meaning the, the distance from the marked vertex and the size on, or the dimension of the hypercube. And uh, on the marked vertex, on this uh, uh, vertex zero, uh, we have also a two by two matrix. That's the difference from the original uh, Shenvi Kenpe Whaley algorithm, uh, where they had also just say this C0 was just minus one. 
Uh, now we have the loop. So again, we have a two-dimensional locally, a two-dimensional vector space. So this is a two by two matrix, which now depends on the dimension of the hypercube. And of course, also on the weight of the loop. So it looks like this. Now, um, the initial state of the search is this psi zero, which you can, after some algebra, rewrite in terms of the states on this, uh, on uh, when you do this reduction to a line. Um, our target state is the loop on the, on the marked vertex. And if you add to these two guys, you add another state psi one, then you can show that they form an approximate invariant subspace. This psi one is, a, is a, again, this was already shown by, by Shenvik and Pavely. It's a state where you like you start at the marked vertex and you go like to the middle of the of this finite line and you alternate you like on every on, on the edge on the or on the arcs connecting x and x plus one. Uh, you have uh, the arcs going to the right and to the left. They have the same magnitude but opposite sign, and they they are given by this formula. Uh, so these three vectors form an approximate invariant subspace. You can actually quite straightforward calculation gives you an exact eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue one that you take the uh, this superposition of this initial state, psi zero, and the target state, the loop at the marked vertex, then for all weights, this is an exact eigenvector of u prime corresponding to eigenvalue one. And uh, you can uh, uh, find then if L is small in some sense, then these two vectors, this, this psi one and like an orthogonal complement to, to this alpha one are almost eigenvectors of U prime, meaning that the diagonal matrix elements are close to one in this, in this spirit. So if you, uh, if you then uh, write the effective evolution operator in this approximate invariant subspace, you can, you can approximate it by this uh, unitary. Uh, this, so this corresponds to alpha one, which is um, like a stable eigenstate corresponds to eigenvalue one. And we have then a rotation by an angle omega, where omega is given by this fraction in this alpha two, alpha three plane. Now, if you, if you decompose the initial state of the search in, into this alpha one, alpha two, alpha three basis, and also the target state, they look like this. So what, uh, the best we can do, like when we have the maximum probability to find the marked vertex is when we uh, do number of steps such that we rotate in this alpha two, alpha three plane by pi. So we start in alpha two and we rotate to get minus alpha two. And then the success probability is given by, by, this, prob by this formula. Uh, so, depends on L and the dimension of the hypercube. So here it's plotted for a 10 dimensional hypercube. So N equal 10, uh, N equal 10. And you can see that it reaches one or close to one for some particular value of L. And if you know the, the papers by, by Thomas Wong, then not surprisingly, this optimal weight of the loop to have the maximum search probability is given by N over uh, two to the power N. And this is exactly the dimension of the hypercube is the degree of the vertex over the total number of vertices. This is exactly the, the formula that was found by, by Thomas Wong in a, in a series of papers. And then it was proven to be the optimal weight by Hoyer and you in um, more general settings. Now for this value of L, this, uh, states alpha one, alpha two simplify considerably that, that you, it's just this uh, anti-symmetric or symmetric superposition of the initial and, and uh, the target state. And to, to do this 
rotation by pi in this alpha two, alpha three plane, we have to make a number of steps, which is pi over omega. Uh, now for, for this optimal weight, this reduces to roughly uh, pi over two times two to, the, two to the n over two. So this is again, exactly this order of square root of n iterations. Uh, so after that, we find the marked vertex with, with probability very close to one. Now we can actually utilize the, uh, the search algorithm to do the state transfer uh, by using the periodicity of the, of the search. Because the, if we, if we uh, keep the search algorithm evolving, like we essentially uh, go from this uh, equal weight superposition to the loop at the marked vertex and then we go back. So we can do the following that we initialize the, the walk at the sender vertex in the loop state. And we have only the, the sender vertex is marked with this weighted loop. And we evolve for this T1 steps. Uh, and after this, we get close to the initial state of the search algorithm, this Psi, psi zero. And then we switch the marking of this uh, vertex. So the sender will turn off the mark and the receiver will turn it on. And then we do again the search, right? So we evolve 41 steps and we get from psi zero to the loop at the marked vertex at the receiver vertex. So like we can with this uh, strategy that we switch on and off the the marking of the sender and receiver vertices, we can utilize directly the search to, to uh, do the state transfer in twice the number of steps needed for the, uh, for the search. Uh, but we can actually do it faster if we have both sender and receiver vertices marked at the same time. That's what we're gonna show. But first we will do it only for the antipod vertices. So again, we have the sender vertex will be the all zero strings and the receiver will be on uh, all one strings. And they will be marked simultaneously with the, with the same coin, again, this, this uh, weighted loop. So the, the strategy of the proof is, is uh, you do the same dimensional reduction as for the search. The only dif difference is that we now have loops on both ends of the, of the line. And the, so there's one additional basis state corresponding to the loop on the, on the uh, antipodal vertex. So we have to modify the, the shift operator and the coin operator accordingly. So in the, in the shift, as double prime, we have the additional uh, part corresponding to the, the loop at the, at the uh, vertex n. And the coin, we have this Cx as before on all position except for zero and, and n, where now on both ends, we have the loops on, on both uh, uh, terminal vertices, we have the coin C zero prime as, as we had before in the search. Now the invariant subspace or approximate invariant subspace is larger in this case. So it will be actually five dimensional. So we have the, our initial state now will be the loop at the sender vertex zero. Target state will be the loop at the antipod vertex. And we add the the states uh, psi zero, that was the initial state of the search. The state psi one, which was the, the state that, that starts at the, uh, at the vertex zero and goes like into the middle of the, of the line that we had in the search. And we add a similar state psi two, which just goes from the other side. So it starts at the uh, vertex N and go goes back to the middle of the, of, the, of the line. So these five vertices form an approximate uh, invariant subspace, meaning that from them you can uh, construct, again, exact eigenvector corresponding to one, and then four 
almost eigenvectors of this u double prime, meaning that again, the diagonal terms of u double prime with these uh, vectors are close to one. Again, one minus something of the order of L over N. So if L is small, then this is almost one. So they are almost eigenvectors. Now the choice of, of the ordering that we have chosen here is uh, such that uh, it turns out that beta two, beta three do not mix with beta four, beta five. So that if you express this U double prime in this basis and you drop everything else, so then it's a block diagonal. And now we have like, uh, so we have this stable state corresponding to eigenvalue one, and then we have two rotations. Rotation in the beta two, beta three plane by an angle omega one, which is given by this fraction, and a rotation in the beta four, beta five plane by an angle omega two. And these angles depend on the dimension of the hypercube and on the weight of, uh, of the loop. Now, if you again rewrite the initial and the target states of this uh, uh, state transfer, so we have the loop at the center vertex, loop at the receiver vertex, in terms of this uh, basis beta j. So uh, we now have, okay, this first part is the same, second part is the same. Here we have uh, plus, 1 over square root of 2 beta 4, and here we have minus 1 over square root of 2 beta 4. So to reach from this state to this one, we have to make uh, a rotation by pi in this beta 4, beta 5 plane to change the sign here. But at the same time, we have to make a 2 pi rotation in the beta, three, beta 2, beta 3 plane, because here is the same guy. And uh, to do this, we have to choose the weight such that these angles, these, these frequencies are omega one is, is twice omega two. And this happens when you choose the weight such that it's two thirds of what we had for the search. So we have to choose the weight in a slightly different way to make them make these angles harmonic so that we do a two pi rotation in one plane and a pi rotation in the other. And um, you can then, okay, again, for this weight, the beta one, beta two states simplify that the, the coefficients are no longer depend on N, but the, the amplitudes are fixed. You can find the eigenvectors of this uh, U double prime corresponding to these uh, eigenvalues rewrite everything the, or rewrite your state of, the, of this uh, state transfer algorithm after these steps in terms of the eigenstates, the, the usual quantum, um, finite dimensional quantum mechanics. So we have this stable state, and then this is the rotation uh, by angle omega one, which is twice omega two, and this is the rotation by omega two. So, if you look then at the fidelity of the state transfer to the antipode vertex or to the loop at the antipode vertex, then this at time t is given by this formula. It depends on the number of steps and on the uh, on this uh, phase omega two, and it reaches one uh, when the uh, uh, time the number of steps is, is pi over omega two which is now faster uh, than what we had in the, when we utilized purely search for one vertex. There we uh, had uh, the runtime was uh, uh, T2, and now this is faster, this is shorter by this factor square root of three over two. So we can reach the, the antipod vertex uh, faster than uh, just by doing the search for, for one vertex and then switching the marking from one vertex to another. Okay, so this is for the antipode. That wouldn't be probably that, that useful just for this particular case, but it works in very similar way at arbitrary distance. But as I said, we <clears throat> for this uh, more general case, we have uh, mostly numerical evidence because the, um, 
the problem cannot be reduced that uh, that much as for the antipode. We cannot reduce it to to a line. Excuse me. In principle, one can reduce the problem to uh, a walk on a rectangular grid, but you have to do it for every possible distance between the, the sender and the receiver. And um, it's, it's still not so simple to, to do then some more, more uh, detailed uh, analysis by hand. So we uh, did mostly uh, numerical uh, investigation. Now, uh, so, so we now have the, again, say sender is at the vertex zero, and the receiver has uh, a distance from the sender D, we will consider the, the same uh, weighted loops on, on both of these vertices, and we take the same weight as we had, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> as we had for the antipode. Like, uh, it, it works pretty well. Something can be done for a uh, general weight L, but in the end, this was the, uh, the optimal choice. Uh, so uh, if we do the numerical simulation of this, say again, for a 10 dimensional hypercube, and it turns out that if the distance between the sender and receiver is uh, greater or equal than two, then it's, uh, you get pretty much the same curve as for state transfer to the antipode. <clears throat> so there we'll show some evidence that essentially it works in, a, in the same way. Uh, when the, the sender and receiver are neighboring vertices, then it's slightly different. So uh, the, the peak of this fidelity as it evolves with, with time is, is wider. Nevertheless, it reaches close to unity at a similar number of steps as for, uh, as for other distances. So that we'll look at that. The reason for this difference, we'll look at that later. So, uh, so let's take the, the case where distance is at least two. So if you, if you look at how's the, how the fidelity uh, changes with the distance, it's pretty much flat except for the next nearest neighbors. When the distance is two, it's slightly lower than for the rest. But uh, even this point, as uh, the dimension of the hypercube increases, uh, this minimal fidelity, sorry, <coughs> improves again, goes to one. Uh, we can, uh, uh, for an arbitrary distance, actually, uh, find an exact eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue one. It has the same form as was the case for, for the uh, transfer to the most distant vertex. So this is an exact eigenvector. We can construct the almost eigenvectors, these gamma two, gamma four, uh, again, in a similar way at, as we had this beta two, beta four. The, the other two eigen, almost eigenvectors that utilizes these uh, states Psi one and Psi two. And for them, we don't have an analytical form. So we don't have the uh, analogy of this in this case, but the invariant subspace, like from the numerical investigation of the, of the relevant part of the spectrum and eigenvectors, uh, the approximate invariant subspace, again, will be five dimensional with the same eigenvalues as, uh, as before. This uh, omega one, omega two will be very close to the formulas we had for the antipode. This is shown, <coughs> illustrated here. Again, for a <clears throat> 10 dimensional hypercube, uh, when we numerically calculate the, the phases of these eigenvalues, omega one, omega two, they are very close to the <clears throat> Uh, formula that we have for the antipode and the ratio also is close to close to two. With increasing distance, it, it improves. 
So that's why we have a better fidelity, <coughs> sorry, with increasing distance. And also the, the eigenvectors, uh, like uh, the decomposition of these uh, states gamma two, gamma four into the eigenvectors is uh, the same as or, or close to the what we had for the state transfer to the antipode. If you calc we can calculate these uh, eigenvectors uh, numerically for some smaller hypercubes because there, <clears throat> as you don't have the reduction to a line, you have to wor work with the whole uh, Hilbert space and it gets uh, uh, complicated, the, the numerical evaluation rather quickly. So you can <clears throat> calculate the overlap of these uh, numerically calculated eigenvectors with these states gamma two, gamma four, it's close to one over square root of two. So there's a solid evidence that for a distance greater or equal than two, the state transfer works in a very similar way as for the most uh, distant vertex. Now, why is the case <clears throat> where, uh, of the nearest neighbors different? So the, the argument is twofold. First uh, reason is that <clears throat> this uh, exact eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue one looks a bit different. Like if you knew, when you search for this uh, eigenstate, what one has to do, like the, this uh, eigenvalue one of this U double prime has a large degeneracy. And you have to, <coughs> sorry, you have to take your initial final state and uh, find the uh, projection of them onto this kernel of U double prime minus one. And this is larger in the case where, where the, a, where the uh, the states are or, or the vertices are are connected by an edge, than in the other cases. So here, this exact eigenstate can be written in, in this form, where now this part here is is uh, what we didn't had before. Uh, so this direction dr ds is a, is a, this corresponds to an arc going from zero to r, and this uh, is an arc going from r to zero because they are connected by an edge. And these amplitudes x, y, z can be found um, analytically by hand. The, the formulas are rather ugly. You can write them in terms of this A and B, where A and B roughly for large N, A is two to the power N, and B is three times two to, two to the power N. So if, the, if you have a large hypercube, then uh, this y and z vanishes exponentially quickly in n, in the dimension of the hypercube, and x goes to, x tends to one. So for large hypercube, you can approximate this exact eigenvector by just this uh, superposition of, of uh, the loop at the sender and loop at the receiver. So that's one argument that we have a different exact eigenstates corresponding to one. The other reason for this different behavior is that uh, if you look at the numerically at the spectrum, it turns out that this uh, uh, one of the pairs of the eigenvalues is, is not there. This, uh, this was uh, this E2 plus minus I omega one is no longer in the spectrum. And only so one is relevant, and this e2 plus minus i omega 2 is relevant. And if we keep the, the weight same as we had before, this uh, two thirds n over two to the power n, then uh, this uh, omega 2 is, is very close to what we had for the antipode. So here's the comparison. Red curve is given by the, the formula we had for the antipode, and the black dots are numerically evaluated phases of these of this pair of eigenvalues. So uh, so to say here the approximate invariant subspace is just three dimensional. We have a stable state that corresponds to eigenvalue one, which does not change, it's gamma zero. And then these two uh, eigenstates uh, corresponding to this complex conjugated pair. So we have 
like one stable state and then rotation in one plane. And uh, <clears throat> if you look how the state looks like after t steps, something like this, you can you can then calculate the the fidelity of state transfer at time t. It's given by this formula where x is this uh, amplitude we had before here. Um, maximum again is reached when the number of steps is chosen such that it's uh, pi over this uh, angle omega two, and uh, then this cosine is uh, is minus one. So this is the maximum fidelity uh, that's in the graph in the plot. It's this red dashed curve. So as n increases, x tends to one. So for large n, we can replace x as one and the maximum fidelity goes to one. And then this simplifies to a fourth power of sine omega two times t over two. So this explains a different width of this peak we had for the fidelity compared to the other cases, other distances here. That simply the, the function is, is different because of the uh, approximate invariance of space is, is only three dimensional and we have just one rotation in this case. Okay, so that uh, that's, uh, that's it, come to the conclusion. So I, I showed two approaches to state transfer on the hypercube that, that utilizes uh, quantum walk search. The first one uses just the search for a single single marked vertex and we switch the marking from after one period of the search, uh, we switch the, the marking from the sender to the receiver and uh, we reach close to, the, the, to this uh, loop on the, on the receiver vertex. In the other approach, we uh, have both vertices marked at the same time with the properly weighted loops. And uh, the second approach, we can do the state transfer faster uh, by a factor of uh, square root of three over two. We had analytical results for uh, search and for the state transfer to the antipodal vertex. Some analytical results for other distances, meaning the exact form of this stable stationary state plus some numerical evidence. Um, Here's the link to the paper on the archive. Uh, it's uh, was submitted some couple of months back to Physica Scripta, and I think it's on a on a good track of being accepted. So I'll then update the link on the archive as well. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was comprehensible and don't uh, hesitate to ask any any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, there are some questions on the chat. Uh huh. So first, it's like when you on like there's slide nine or ten. I think you are talking about like uh, how to partition the cube like with one loop on the end. I think yeah, that's one. Yeah. Yeah, and then like Sony asked uh, if oh, oh on page nine. This one? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's just uh, equitable rotation. Sorry? Uh, those like equitable partition. Those partitions. Mm, okay, I'm, I'm not not sure what, what you mean. Sorry. <laughs> uh, What would be the equitable partition? So equitable partition will be a partition that is like uh, invariant under the uh, under the automorphism. Hmm. Uh, I'm, with... I'm not sure because like a uh, Okay, uh, like it's it's a 
audible? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, means uh, these three vertices uh, yeah. have the same uh, degree. Uh, so we can merge it into the one vertices. All three vertices, uh, you are uh, arrowing uh, towards one yes. vert vertex. So, so all three have the same uh, vertex degree. So that's why we are uh, merging it into um, one vertex. I, I, I think that's not the argument. Like I think here it's more about the distance from the from the marked vertex so like these uh, these three vertices are are direct neighbors of the marked vertex so they will in the reduction to a line they will be like merged to a, a vertex one then this they, they these have distance two so it will be merged to a, a vertex two and this one has the distance three so this will be a last vertex it's probably like it's not. Uh, um, I guess this is more like a, a graphical representation. The the real reduction is like you have to you have to combine the quantum states uh, to to get to define these uh, basis states then for the quantum walk on a line. Um, so that's more more. Proper proper way how to how to look at this, but but it's uh, that you group uh, states corresponding to being on a on a on a vertex that is at a given distance from the from the center. So here these vertices the the weight Hemming weight of this x is is this small x. Because because all uh, three vertices have the same probability when we are talking about walk. reaching uh, probability into all three vertex uh, yes they are yeah uh, so yeah that's that's right that like the as, since we are using this grover coin so like all three of these directions are are uh, treated in the same way so that's the uh, that's uh, uh, that it comes definitely from using this uh, this grover coin that that the that it treats the the directions in the in the same way. Okay, I got it, sir. And one more question from me. Uh, yeah. So you are uh, working on a discrete time quantum walk. Mm -hmm. So if yes. we uh, do this analytical result uh, using the continuous time quantum walk, uh, then we can do some comparative study between the discrete time and continuous time quantum walk. Yes, I, yeah, that, that should be uh, should be possible. I have to say, I'm not not very much familiar with the continuous time quantum walks. Like I, I, I know how it works, but I've <laughs> never done the calculations uh, myself, uh, and I'm not not hundred percent sure if there is a. But, but there's probably can be also an analogy of this. Uh, marking of a of a vertex with some uh with some weight uh, like we have this weighted loop here actually i think that has an analogy in the continuous time case as well that you that uh, in, like what you do in the in the continuous time case is that you so you have a, a hamiltonian that's uh, proportional to the say uh, laplacian of the of the graph or and agency. you and you have you put some on-site energy and the yes. the value of this energy is essentially like in some sense you can think of this as as a as a weight of the loop so it should be possible to do the similar calculation for for the continuous time case but i have to admit i've, I've never done it myself Okay, I'm working on uh, continuous time quantum walk, so uh, I this thought came in my mind. There's another question. Mm -hmm. uh, about distance regular graphs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you kind of, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, 
it might be the case. I mean, I, I think uh, for the search with this weighted loop, I think uh, uh, Hoyer and you showed that you can you can have this uh, optimal. You can find an optimal loop to get a search with with high probability. Um, I'll, I'll I would have to look up the paper again. But I am not sure. I mean, so so if this works, then you can use this strategy with with switching of the of the marked vertex, and you get the state transfer as well. I'm not sure if the if this uh, other approach where we have both vertices marked at the same time if that works because the like that the fact that the search works does not guarantee that this uh, state transfer with two vertices marked will work uh, as well because uh, there we have uh, uh, usually you have a, a, a higher dimensional invariant subspace like the so to say the search uh, evolves like if you can do the search for two marked vertices, but there you will find you will reach a state that this is which is a, a symmetric superposition of the two marked vertices. And for the state transfer, this is not enough because you also need the anti symmetric superposition. So I think it's not guaranteed that if the search works with, with unit probability, that also this state transfer will work with unit probability. Uh, but maybe maybe something more can be said on for distance regular graphs, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure about this. Sorry. Okay, so if there's no more question for Martin, let's thank Martin again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again. Thanks for inviting me to to give uh, give a talk. It was nice seeing you again.